Hello and welcome to our latest webinar. Before getting into this, I thought we'd just start with the normal housekeeping. So just to reassure you that we will be recording this webinar and you'll be sent a recording, sent the recording with some useful resources afterwards. So any technical problems, be assured you'll be able to get the information that you need. We are going to have time, or I hope we're going to have time for some questions at the end. Please, could you use the Q&A box to, to put your questions in? It makes life a lot easier for us rather than sifting through the chat. You know, if you want to have a chat with other people, please go ahead and use the chat box. That would be great too. I hope you've seen the poll and I hope you've been able to respond to that. And um, we'll be talking about the results of that as well. So really, let's get to it. I want to introduce you to, to Ellis. Ellis is a business psychologist who we've worked with for some time now. Not only is she busy using her skills, helping and training within businesses, but she's also pursuing a doctorate. So we feel very privileged that she's found the time and agreed to present this webinar for us because it's on a topic that we believe is absolutely vital for employers and employees and business output too. So, Ellis, over to you to tell us about you know, waking up managers. Teams' mental health is important. Over to you. Thank, thank you so very much. Good morning, everyone. First of all, massive thank you for joining us at this webinar today. I know it's kind of the middle of the workday. I'm sure your inboxes are pretty full. Um, uh, but I'm absolutely just shocked that you have decided to press pause and come and come and join us to discuss a topic that is really important, um, why mental health is your business, particularly if you are in a managerial role. And I'm not here to add another task to your to-do list. I'm here to equip you with some simple and effective tools that can hopefully improve well-being of your team, but could very well be a game changer for productivity, talent retention, and lots of other values. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, before we dive in, I thought I'd give you a bit of information that my name is Ellis and I'm a business psychologist. And you might be thinking, what on earth does that mean? Um, so I kind of think of myself as someone who bridges the world of psychology and business. I study how people interact in the workplace and my goals are to create healthier and more productive environments and basically make people thrive at work. Um, and I also have a bit of a story to share with you as well, because I've observed quite a lot in the years that I've been doing this role. And the manager is absolutely pivotal when it comes to a team's mental health. And I once consulted for this tech company where the team was uh, incredibly young, full of really energetic and innovative ideas and people. And their manager was very much a seasoned veteran in the tech world and was really highly competent. But I would say perhaps a bit set in their way. Um, you know, very much that kind of head down, get on with it sort of manager, which had worked for him in the past. But what we noticed is that people started to disconnect from the team, um, particularly amongst the younger team members. Absenteeism became frequent, productivity was low, um, and the overall atmosphere just felt really tense. And it's really important to understand that ignoring mental well-being can have real consequences for team cohesion and productivity. And the scope of this issue is far more extensive than a single team or a single organisation. In fact, the whole country, it has an impact. Um, research has shown us that poor mental health accounts for over half of all work-related illnesses. And you've probably already heard that one in four adults experience poor mental health in any given year. Um, perhaps that might even be more nowadays. And the impact of this isn't something that can be ignored. And knowing that mental health challenges are so prevalent in the workplace, this next statistic is even more concerning. Um, according to the Priory Group, 71% of people wouldn't tell their employer if they were struggling with mental health. Um, and, you know, think about that for a moment. Instead of reaching out for support or, or understand, they'd also rather lie about a, a made-up illness. Um, perhaps people might say, I've got a stomach bug or a migraine or COVID, instead of admitting that actually I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Um, so why is this happening? You know, is it stigma? Is it lack of trust? Um, 
you know, either way, as managers, it's our responsibility to create a culture where employees feel safe to speak openly about their mental health without fear of repercussions. And according to research by the Workforce Institute, you also see that spanning 10 countries, our managers impact our mental health just as much as our partners do. Let's just let that sink in a moment. Managers have just as much an impact on our mental health as our partners or significant others do. Your influence can be just as powerful. So if you think about your actions and your management style doesn't have a lasting impact on your team, then you need to think again. Um, they not only affect performance and job satisfaction, but also touch on the mental well-being of people that you know you're entrusted to lead. And it's not just about being a nice manager, it's about understanding the long-term effect that your managerial style could have on someone's overall well-being. Um, and the mental health isn't just the absence of mental illnesses and mental health disorders. It is that state of well-being where people reach their potential, can cope with the normal life stresses, they work productively, contribute to the workplace and their community. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not just on the flip side, not having bad days or sad days. Um, and mental health isn't something you can simply just snap out of. Um, you know, a poor mental health isn't something you can just snap out of. And I think a lot of people associate mental health with negative side of things. Um, so there's this prevalent stigma around it, particularly in the workplace. I've, I've heard many people say, you know, we leave our personal problems at home. Um, but let's just challenge that notion for a moment about leaving your mental health or your personal problems at home. We spend roughly a third of our lives at work. So how realistic is it to partition that part of us so sharply? We're not here to be robots. We can't just section our lives that way. We're human beings with this range of emotions. And unfortunately, it doesn't adhere to this nine to five schedule or whatever your working hours are. The idea that these personal things or our mental health shouldn't infiltrate the workplace is so outdated and it's fundamentally flawed. Um, and as managers, it's not about prying into people's personal lives and mental health, but creating an environment where your team feels seen and feels supported, be it professionally, but also emotionally. And if you don't, it's honestly a recipe for failure. Um, so as a working population, one in six people experience poor mental health. So if you picture a team of, say, 30 people, around five of those could be experiencing poor mental health. Um, and it's not worth reminding you that it's the most common reason for workplace illness. And the consequences of, of poor well-being can be serious. If it's not managed well in your workplace, you'll likely see a decrease in productivity, You'll have a harder time keeping good employees and attracting new ones. Team morale will suffer. And that also has financial costs for the business. Um, Deloitte was saying that the cost of poor mental health to employers is around 56 billion pounds a year. Now, what I'm going to say might be a bit controversial, but hear me out. Whilst many people consider mental health talent retention and turnover to be primarily HR related issues. I firmly believe that a lot of the time at their core, management issues, because managers are the ones on the front line. They're interacting daily with their team members. You're the first person notices changes in behavior or performance or morale. So therefore your position is unique and indeed the responsibility I think should be should be around our management team to support or provide some interventions. Um, and remember, you set the tone of the team and the culture. So if you prioritise mental health and well-being, it becomes this fabric of daily work life, and it's not just a, a box to tick in some HR form. Um, 
but it is important to note that the attitudes towards mental health are continuously shifting and that's thanks to greater societal awareness and advocacy um, and I also think that even with this progressive landscape we see generational differences for example older generations might have grown up in an era where discussing mental health was taboo whereas the younger generations like the millennials and gen z are so much more open and proactive about mental well-being generally speaking and they're often a lot of the driving force between these these stigmatized these stigmatizing initiatives in the workplace and i'm sure in most workplaces you'll find yourself managing team members across various generations and they have their own views communication styles expectations about the workplace and particularly in the UK our workforce is uniquely diverse in age and we have an aging population so people are working later in their lives due to the shifts of pension ages and the cost of living and we're also seeing on the other side the rise of generation C or Z entering the workforce workforce they've got different values and attitudes towards work um, and each group of generations bring their own set of strengths and perspectives and yes challenges as well um, but that diversity isn't just interesting it is actually incredibly beneficial um, but we need to learn how to manage such diverse team members in adapting you know their communication styles and being sensitive to different cultural and generational needs and what motivates people and what people need is quite different across the board. Um, and I spend a lot of time working in, gen in organisations and having conversations about supporting staff mental health. Um, and I'd like to let you know that it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, and there's some great studies that look at what are the help seeking behaviours and what do people want at work and what, how do people want to be approached? Um, and there's around four different general types of people when it comes to mental health at work. Um, firstly, you've got people who prefer to self-resolve, self-solution. You know, they, they want to solve any mental health concerns on their own. These are often older generations. You know, they're not there to actively seek out for help in the workplace. Um, and then you've got people who aren't comfortable yet engaging with the workplace or, or maybe even therapy, um, but they will opt for more anonymous self-help tools as a first step. And then you've got those that seek immediate guidance and want structure and actionable advice and are often really proactive in seeking their help. Um, and then you've got people who really want to express themselves and be very much deeply understood. Um, and I see this much more with the younger generations because mental health loses that previously held stigma. And for managers, it's really key to understand that this isn't just fixed categories I'm giving you. It is a bit of a spectrum, but hopefully it helps you consider that there are different differences in people's needs and how they want to approach mental health. Um, so having said that, I'm going to ask you another question um, and we're going to put another poll up for you. Um, what worries you the most? Imagine for a moment that someone on your team is experiencing poor mental health. What worries you the most about approaching this delicate topic with that colleague? And if your concern isn't on this list, do let us know in the chat box what your primary concerns are. Um, the webinar is recorded, but I won't read anyone's names out. So do let us know. And for the purpose of the recording, um, the options that we have are fear of saying the wrong thing, uncertainty about professional boundaries, concerns about confidentiality, lack of training on how to handle the situation, worrying over damaging the working relationship, 
fear of legal ramifications, being unsure if it's our place to intervene, don't want to be intrusive or make the person feel uncomfortable or other things. Okay. So let's look at some top talking tips when you're approaching a colleague about their mental health. Um, and these are simple, actionable steps and that can help you navigate some sensitive conversations. Um, and the first point is to talk about it. If you do notice a change in someone's behaviour or all performance, um, don't ignore it. It's okay to start that conversation. Um, you could say something like, how are you really doing? You don't seem like your usual self. Do you want to have a talk about it? Um, and this is particularly helpful for those of you that mentioned fear of saying the wrong thing in the poll. Um, you know, we're going to notice that there's, there's a difference, but we're approaching it in a non-judgmental way. So we're not saying things like, you've been really moody today, or you've made all these mistakes. You know, we're saying, I've noticed you've not been your usual self. Just wanted to ask, are, are you okay? And I might even say as well, um, you know, this is confidential. Please don't worry about um, about this. You can you can talk to me openly if there's something that you want to say. Now, not everyone is going to open up to you, okay? Um, as we've said, some people prefer to to keep their personal and mental health concerns to themselves. Um, and if they if they don't want to go there, then just you know graciously say. Okay, I appreciate that. Doors always open if you want to talk to me or if, if you change your mind. Um, and just and just yeah, just let them let them feel comfortable walking away. Um, but if they do open up to you, then give them a safe space to share. Um, you know, give that active listening where you're not interrupting. Don't judge. Don't offer unsolicited unsolicited advice. Um, if you're worried about professional boundaries or being intrusive, then this approach respects those boundaries because you are just there to listen to anything that they're willing to share with you. Um, and, and if you're worried about saying the wrong thing, again, remember that we're here to simply listen. Um, so just allow them to, to speak openly and, and share with you what, what might be happening. And kindness goes a long way. Say something empathetic. I, I appreciate you telling me. Sounds like a lot is going on. Um, you can thank them for telling you or being honest. And that will help build that trust and could alleviate concerns about damaging a working relationship. And it creates that psychologically safe environment where people can feel like they can be honest about their health, their well-being, and there's no repercussions for that. You know, you've you've accepted it, you're appreciative. And trust me, at times there's there's times that people say to me things that I don't really know how to respond and you know, I think it's okay to say that and say I don't know how to respond but I'm really pleased that you did tell me okay um and don't assume that you know what they need um it's always better to ask them directly is there anything that I can do to help is there something that you need and this approach can be quite helpful if you're unsure if it's your place to intervene. Um, and in my experience, I don't get a lot of people asking for anything in particular. They're just glad that I gave them an opportunity to tell me or ask them. Um, or sometimes I might get someone say, you know, I need a bit of a longer deadline on a task. Um, and very rarely do I get told something that is out of the question. Um, so it's really helpful to, to actually ask them, is there something I can do to help? Is there something that you need from me? Um, and then one of the things about mental health is knowing at what point does it become a, a concern that we go and get appropriate professional help? Um, and generally speaking, if someone's been experiencing poor mental health for two weeks, or it's having a significant impact on their day-to-day -day life and you're noticing some, some really concerning signs, um, then, then I would always signpost to get professional help. Um, you could suggest, have you thought about talking to your doctor or if you've got an employee assistance programme, um, you know, have, you, have you contacted those? They, they might be able to, to give you some, some great support there. 
and it might be that you have um you know you, you can you can finish the conversation there um and i would i would r remind you that if you're concerned about legal ramifications or a lack of training you know don't overstep your role okay um ask them to see what they, what you can do to support and then kind of guide them to the support that you think might be more more appropriate whether it be a medical professional hr or so on um but there are supports that you can do as managers right um it doesn't have to be grand gestures even sometimes small meaningful actions can actually make a world of difference um you know even just saying hey let's go and grab a cup of tea and just just take 10 minutes to take a little breather um even that can make a big difference um but there are key areas that you could you could explore um so firstly open communication generally i think works really well um encourage them to speak freely create that environment where they can do that without fear of any kind of judgment or repercussions you could have a regular one-to-one -one check in and that's not to necessarily talk about their mental health as i said you know don't overstep your role and position but just have this regular check-in to, to say, is there anything that's going on at work in terms of concerns or challenges? Is there anything you want to share with me about your well-being? And just keeping it, um, keeping it regular can encourage that open and confidential dialogue. The next thing I think managers would do well to do is to think about work-life balance. It's really critical to respect employees' time off and encourage them to disconnect particularly when it comes to lunch breaks and work hours and you know, annual leave, um, because your rested employees are more likely to be productive and that will help your, their mental health as well. But time and time again, particularly now that we work online, I see people working through their lunch breaks and eating lunch at their desk. I see people responding to emails at all hours of the day um, and never really switching off. Um, you know, most people probably admit that they check their emails first thing in the morning, probably check their emails in the evening as well. Um, and it's it's really good practice for a manager to kind of set that work-life balance expectations and say, hey, it's okay. I encourage you not to eat lunch at your desk. Answer these emails at this point. Um, and I'd also recommend to lead by example, because if you're emailing them at that time of the night, it might then put pressure on them to think that they need to be working as well. Schedule sends does exist. So, you know, try and utilize those kinds of tools to give people a bit of space, particularly if you're concerned for their well-being. Then as a manager, providing resources is really helpful. Um, it might be that you have programs going on at the workplace already. So you can have an employee assistance program I've seen actual counselling systems and mindfulness groups and yoga groups and all kinds of wonderful things that people do within the organisation. Um, but managers need to know what they are, what they offer, how to access them. You know, what's the number that you call or what time of day do you, can you access them and, and make sure that you can quickly provide those resources um, and, and have knowledge on what they're for. And... You may also have um, additional resources outside of the workplace. Um, there's some phenomenal community groups that are, are set up all over the country. Just the other day, I was talking to someone who lived in Bristol and we looked at what supports were outside of the workplace and we found a walking group called Dudes and Dogs. So shout out to Dudes and Dogs because I love that name. Um, and they went and they said it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. And so, you know, please do look outside of the uh, the workplace because some people may feel more comfortable with that. And I'll show you how to, you can find those local resources in a moment. Um, as managers, you must know your policies, um, you know, know your company policies inside and out particularly around the things that are potentially going to impact mental health 
um, or relevant to mental health. So your absence, bereavement, alcohol and drugs, bullying and discrimination, the harassment, all of those fantastic policies, um, you need to know um, what, what the approach is from the organisation um, and have easy access to them. So learn the policies, that's a nice quick win for you. Fifth, you can have a look at action plans for those that are struggling with poor mental health. You can look at reasonable adjustments, additional support, um, or even referral to professional support could be considered as an action as well. Um, but just remember that one size doesn't fit, fit all. So when you have that discussion and you ask them, you know, what can I do to support? You could even say, you know, should we put a plan of action together about how we're going to nav navigate the next week or navigate the next month or however it is um, that you want that, that will suit their situation. But always ask what they need. Don't make assumptions. Find out what specific actions might help them the most, whether it's flexibility in the work schedule, um, additional resources. You know, you've got to know what it is that's going to work from them. And hopefully by keeping these sort of areas in, in mind, um, you'll be well on your way to creating a more supportive and mentally healthy workplace. But I do want to really emphasise the crucial point that it's important to recognise your limits as a role as, a, as their manager. You're not a mental health professional and you don't need to be. Your job is to simply notice and listen and show empathy um, but signpost them to the appropriate supports where they may, may be needed. Um, <clears throat> you might want to signpost them to their HR, okay, and get advice from there. If you have an employee assistance programme, utilise that. Um, the Hub of Hope is a fantastic resource. Um, it's an app and an online website. And this is where I go to find all of the local and national supports in the UK. If you simply look at Hub of Hope, um, you can put in your location, you can put in what sort of concerns you have. And that's how I came across fabulous community groups like Foods and Dogs and all of these other wonderful places that might be more supportive um, in that local area for that person. Some workplaces have mental health first aiders. You know, they're, they're trained to be able to recognise or mental health have those more long-term conversations in terms of you know how is this affecting you um and and what sort of uh, information can you can they provide about mental health and about um supportive resources um so they they, they have the, the kind of freedom to have more conversations with people because of their training they're certainly not there to be an ongoing support um but you know they are there to be to be able to buy, provide a more detailed in, uh, discussion on mental health. So utilise them if you've had them trained. Um, and of course, there's numerous charity organisations like MIND. Um, there's a great, great scientist tech service called Shout, very similar to the Americans, and they are invaluable sources of support. Um, so encouraging your team members to speak with their doctors or consult with um, other external supports like these mental health services and charities, they're really helpful for you as well. Now, I'd like to circle back. Um, oh, sorry, just to show you the Hub of Hope website, that is what it looks like. Um, so as you can see, you can put in your address, you can even put young person support um, specific in there. And then, of course, um, it will come up with some fantastic resources in your local area. So now I'd like to circle back round to coaching different generational needs. You've got somebody who doesn't want to talk, particularly common in the older generations where there might still be a stigma associated with mental health. Um, you know, your simple acknowledgement and warm words to say, hey, I've noticed you're not being yourself. Do you want to talk about it? My door's open if you don't. Um, you know, do let me know if there's anything you need. That kind of acknowledgement or warm words can be comforting enough, even if they don't want to discuss it further. And it certainly helps with that culture of support. Um, 
particularly among the younger generations that value the self-help tools, um, you know, being able to access those materials shows that you understand their needs um, and are, are, you know, dedicated to supporting mental health. Um, and, we, and, and that can help people um, who, are, you know, across the board, really. And it is good practice to not just be reactive with it, but also be proactive and say to your team, I went to this mental health webinar, here's some great resources that I've learned, my door's open if you want to talk. And, you know, you're already giving them the self-help tools before you've actually recognised or seen any concerns. And doing that regularly is fantastic. You know, if you see a great webinar, if you see a great LinkedIn post or something kind of gives you a little bit of information, share it with them and say, you know, just want to reiterate, dedicate it to your well-being, here's some information, door is open. That really helps people that may not feel comfortable talking to you directly, but they might see your self-help support and think, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach out to the mental health charity or or my EAP or so on. Um, and some people might want more tangible solutions like flexible work hours. Uh, they might actually prefer you to show them the employee assistance program website properly. Um, you know, at times it might take a little bit more time to actually, um, you know, guide them. Um, which is why I say it's so important to know your policies and know your EAPs and know what supports are out there. And just being able to access them and demonstrate that um, will really help people that prefer that immediate guidance and, and structure. Um, and those that want to be really deeply understood, you know, that's where we step in with our listening ears and just let them know that whatever they're experiencing, they can have a chat with us. We may not be able to help them directly with it, um, but, you know, we, we respect that their mental health and well-being is a big part of their lives um, and we're, we're just willing to listen and show support and that won't go unnoticed. Um, so whether it's listening without judgment, offering self-help tools, taking more proactive measures with things like flexible like working or providing opportunities for discussions about mental health, you know, you will address some of the varied needs across the generations and make you a far more effective and empathetic manager. But I do want to make sure that you're okay and that you're safe. I always say to people, you can't pour from an empty cup. You know, you've got to make sure that you recognize that if you're not doing too well, then you're not gonna have a, as much battery to, to give to other people. Um, I also want you to consider your own needs in this. Um, and firstly, um, you know, don't judge. I like to say all behavior is communication. And sometimes you may notice performance changes before emotional changes. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that come to me and say, hey, I'm struggling with this employee. They're not doing this, this, this and this. And they haven't taken an opportunity to have an open conversation and say, is everything okay? We've noticed you're not being yourself recently. You know, is there if is there something that is going on? Is there any reasons why this is happening? You know, do let us know. Um, so don't judge. Um, and actually take an opportunity to explore their experience or circumstances behind the behavior first. And that will help, hopefully prevent conflict okay um also take time and space you know opening up might not come naturally for people um, you might want to check in again but you also might want to give space when needed and that is the same for you okay if you're not feeling like having a conversation right now perhaps you're not the best person to do it that might be where I say let's get a mental health first aider in okay um and keep your own boundaries whilst I'm trying to encourage people to be supportive you're not a mental health professional you might not have the kind of mental health training that you want or need um and you're not there to be the sole support system for someone with a mental health concern so know your limits um, and signpost to those professional services when they're needed 
Um, and yeah, really reiterate that support yourself. You can't pour from an empty cup. Make sure you're looking after your own well-being because you will be far more effective in supporting others as a manager, as a parent, partner, son, daughter, whoever you are. Um, you know, you will have more to give. Um, so it's so important that we start with ourselves before we um, promote other people's well-being. Um, so that concludes my discussion part of the day. Um, thank you so much. I just want to um, pop that poll back up again to see, um, you know, let's talk about how you feel now. We're going to ask you exactly the same question. What, how do you feel now? How do you feel supporting a colleague's currently experiencing poor mental health? Let's see how much difference we've made. Um, I'd also like to ask, open it up to questions. So welcome back, Catherine. Yes, we've got, um, we had some questions in advance, but we've also got some interesting ones coming through. So I think, shall we start off with those and then we'll come back to the results of the, 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 the second poll. Um, so what's the best way of approaching Gen Z to discuss the safety topics and company compliance needs? Oh, a good question. Um, I think that something that I've noticed is that people want a bit more of an understanding of why they need to do certain things so let and I do you know what I have a I have an example to give here and um, someone approached me once saying that they've got someone who refuses to wear a hairnet right and it's a kind of safety compliance thing and um, they were getting very frustrated with that with that person and I and the first thing I was like well have you asked them why they aren't wearing their hairnet and to be quite honest with you, their initial reaction was judgment. It was, you know, oh, they just don't want to mess their hair up or, you know, it's a kind of how they look reasons. Um, so, I, you know, asking them why they're not being compliant with things and actually taking an opportunity to say, look, tell us tell us what your experience is um, and, and, and help us understand. Um, and then the other thing that... Um, they, we that I noticed was that they're just kind of telling them where your hair is and not really under not really explaining the whys and the the why not side of things and that does help people become more motivated if they understand what they're what they're doing and what the end goals are and what what the, the benefits are um and going back to the that person um when we actually had a conversation with them they were getting you know, burns on the sides of their ears from wearing the hairnet. And it was actually quite painful. And this individual also had sensory sensitivities. Um, so, you know, there were other things that were impacting them, like actually labels on clothing and the, the the kind of pain they were feeling from the hairnet. You know, it wasn't anything to do with like a vanity reason. Um, and then once we've taken the time to actually have that conversation, and also help them understand why we need to do certain things. Um, it made that person adapt their behaviour. If you want to adapt behaviours, you have to take time to explain to them why, why not, what the goals are. And don't just tell people, you know, where you're heading. Because sometimes that comes across as quite demanding and not really something that motivates people to take action. It's, yeah. it's so important, isn't it? Not only for health and safety, but just for, for communication and, and, and everything else, just to, to yeah. say, go, go further than, than the assumptions. Okay, yeah. another question here. Um, do you think it's mentally healthier to split time between the office and home rather than being at home permanently? And do you have anything to sort of support support your, your views on that? Any, any, any thoughts? Yes, yeah, I do have thoughts on this. Um, so the, 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 the answer to that question is it entirely depends, right? It depends on the individual because some people will be their best at, at work and some people will be their best at home. Um, let's take neurodiversity into the conversation here, right? I know people who, you know, they prefer their own space and they find noisy environments incredibly difficult to navigate the commute into work is stressful and so when they work at home they are far more productive they're far more relaxed 
they're able to get you know things done to better quality because of the benefits that being at home affords them um and there are some people um with certain needs that actually probably would would struggle in a working environment and perhaps don't get the opportunities that they deserve because we're being very strict on oh well, you have to come to the office a certain amount of time and if you can't if you can't do this then you know we're we're not going to afford you a a a, a job in the first place or or even a promotion so it's about kind of understanding people's needs and talents um sometimes people do prefer to come into the office sometimes it's essential for people to come into the office so i could list a million reasons why it is helpful to be in the office but I can list quite as many reasons as to why it's not. Um, so it's about getting that balance, understanding the needs of the person. Um, and I'd also encourage people, you know, if you are going to go down the hybrid route or getting people back into the office, again, going back to the previous question, you've got to explain why. And a lot of the times I'm seeing workplaces saying, come back to the office because we want you to. And there's not really a concrete reason or ex explanation as to why that is. A lot of the time it comes down to a lack of trust. They don't trust people to work as productively at home. Um, or it might be due to financial reasons. They're like, we spend a lot of money on the office and we just want to make use of it. Um, you know, if I get my work done just as well or even better at home, you've got to provide me with motivation to come into the office and you know if I'm not going to work as well and I spend a lot of money getting there and then I come home drained because I've taken hours out of my day to get there and it, do you know what I mean you've, you've got yeah. to provide a value about going into the work office and I suppose if if you know when you look at the individuals if the team doesn't work as a series of individuals you have to have an honest conversation about what is yeah. it we're trying to to achieve and because sometimes there is a conflict and we have to be adult and, as you say, have a conversation with everybody involved expressing to be mm. able to find the right solution, isn't it? Because sometimes there are changes that need to be made as we all evolve, but it's got to be done in an open environment, hasn't it? Absolutely. And, and you know, how I work is going to be different to how some other people work. And I think that's a, a real damaging approach when people say, we want you to work like this. Yeah. and are not taking the needs of other people into account and particularly with the younger generations like generation z and and uh you know they're so much more aware of neurodiversities and and mental health um then they are going to to probably be more reluctant to come back full-time into the office because they can see the value of not being in the office mm. Mm. Um, and I've had it myself where I've been frustrated going somewhere where it's been so unproductive and I'm like if I'd have stayed at home I'd have saved all this money all this time been at home with the family and the dog and and got loads more work done and and you know we need to recognize that times are changing and and we do need to adapt to a different work style yeah no I agree I'm going to I've got some quite interesting ones coming through so I'm going to have a look at one that's come through um one the first person's came through if you uh assure an employee that the chat is confidential but something is said that you feel needs to be escalated to HR for their benefit or safety mm -hmm. where do you stand in sharing that information or or perhaps better ways what would you do in that situation probably is that a better better way to ask that for you Absolutely. Great question. There are times where confident confidentiality don't apply, particularly if you're concerned for their safety or the safety of others. Um, again, I suppose it depends on what it is that they're approaching me with. So like, let's say they are, they've mentioned that they have um, a substance use concern. And, you know, part of their role is driving and that could potentially be of a safety risk. You know, to have an honest conversation and say, you know, I really respect that you've told me this. Um, and I want to reiterate that this isn't, you know, something that's going to get you into trouble because what we need to do is 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 actually be open and honest, talk to HR, get you the support that you need and deserve. Um, and and that's beneficial for you, but also for other people at this point. Mm -hmm. Um 
I've had similar conversations around bullying and harassment and racism in the workplace and things like that. And it's like, you know, you don't deserve to go through this. And there are supports and things that I believe we should do. And I and I hope you respect that we should tell somebody about this. But what I don't do, my top tip here, is I try to keep them as involved as possible. I don't just take over the situation. I don't just go, well, I've got to tell HR, you know, and, and, and crack on with that. I explain what I need to do and why and, and, and kind of, you know, explain the morale behind it. And then I give them some element of choice and say, do you want to come with me? Would you like me to do this without you? this is what I'm going to say yeah and make some notes on a piece of paper and say right this is how I'm going to approach the situation do you want me to make the phone call in the room with you you know just kind of giving them a little bit of choice so they don't feel like I'm taking something on board and then it's out of their control and 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 I also like to try and explain if I know um what the potential outcomes might be because a lot of the time it's fear of the repercussions and say look because you've told me about your alcohol concern you know we are going to be supportive of this it was the right thing to do what we will do is is we'll have uh we'll, we'll likely have a conversation with hr they'll probably refer you to occupational health um but you know i can check in with you and you know just kind of paint a picture in the future that says this was a great thing that you did well done it's difficult but i'm here to support and this may be difficult for you to answer, but have you found that you found a resolution with it whilst in your experiences without having to say, well, I'm going to just have to tell them anyway? Do you, do you find you've always found a middle ground when you've had that conversation? Because it's a very difficult thing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, yes. Um, sometimes people do get, get what I call the stress response, right? And they mm -hmm. just go that kind of fight or fly and they're just like, you know, they get a little bit angry, perhaps, or they just want to avoid the situation and run away. Um, and at that point, I think, okay, do I need to do anything right now? How urgent is this safety thing? Perhaps? You know, because it might be that actually giving them a bit of space for an hour and saying, hey, let's come back to this. Um, let's go and take a break and then come back to this. And, and you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what else we can do. Um, that's been sufficient to just let the, the the stress calm down a bit and then and then move forward um there's only been two times I can think of right now where I've had to actively act without their without their permission or mm -hmm. um out of a confidentiality issue um and at that point you just got to know that you're doing the right thing at times we have to do things that make us uncomfortable get your own support as mm. what I would say you know you are people to talk to HR talk to your employee assistance program a pass if it's a legal concern just to kind of get that reassurance that you've done the right thing you've, you've done everything you can and if that person isn't wanting to see eye to eye with it um, then unfortunately you know you can't convince everybody sometimes um, but actually those two times I will say eventually they came round. It was a bit uncomfortable for a while. Um, you know, I had to whistle blow a couple of times and uh, you know, it did cause quite a lot of repercussions for a number of people, which doesn't make you the most popular person. Um, however, after a while, you know, when you explained yourself and they they had time to sink it in, actually, they they understood that it was the right thing to do. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the pressure like that, but actually hearing somebody, I think is so valuable because these are the things that people really worry about and, mm -hmm. and, and hearing how you go through that practically, I think is, is really valuable. So, so thank you, Ellis, for that. Okay. Oh, on to some, um, what is your viewpoint of mental health first aiders in the workplace? Are they useful? And um, what's your thoughts on an HR person being a mental health first aider? Oh, okay, a two part. Um, <laughs> so mental health first aid, I think brilliant. If you have a supportive strategy in place beyond mental health first aid. Okay. You know, imagine 
take, take a physical first aider, for example. You know, we do lots of things to support physical first aiders or try to prevent things from becoming a, a physical health risk. You pap test your equipment. You have, you know, DSC assessing. You, you know, go around and risk assess the building. And it's like all of these sorts of things happen. And there's policies and there's probably training for other people. And it's it's very much a proactive and a reactive measure. Yeah. And I worry that a lot of organisations have taken mental health first aid and they've done it as a bit of a tick box exercise and not thought about the bigger picture. Um, and so MHFA works beautifully and I've seen it work amazingly. But it, you need policies you need training you need reactive measures as well as proactive measures um a lot of the time you need to address cultural issues and um you, you know not just do the a couple of things a year but actually make it a consistent strategy within your work life um so yeah mhfa is great um and i can say that from a psychologist perspective I was at a conference and we were talking about MHFA and saying this is brilliant you know we need people to provide early intervention and to encourage people to get professional help before it reaches crisis and you know we were really thinking this is great um from a professional perspective but a lot of organizations fall short because they haven't really thought about it fully and need a better strategy Mm, yeah, I think so. You need to support your first aid, your mental health first aiders, don't you? Um, and, and they can only do that within a structure. So, yes. yes. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, how do you successfully balance checking in with staff so they don't feel mm. micromanaged? I'd go back to what I said about the generational stuff is that, um, you know, people have differences in ideas and opinions on on things like that so some people might really value a weekly check-in and other people might think oh my gosh this is stressing me out because they're constantly on my case um so it's about again going back down to that individual and saying you know should we have another check-in how does a week sound or is that too too much you know I don't want to come across too full-on but ultimately I'm available if you wanted to have that discussion. I think just be a little bit more flexible and, and yeah, again, go to that individual needs and just ask them directly, you know, is this too much? Because if it is, fine, I respect that. Um, you know, what what would you prefer? So almost you need a sort of managerial style that, that suits the individual, don't you? You need that sort of check-in that, that works, works for both of you, don't you? Yeah. 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 And a lot of the time, what I'm asking you to do is take the time to have these conversations mm. and just be just recognize that how you want to do things might not be how they want to do things mm. um, and to have that honest conversation and at times there are times where I have to say okay well we're going to need to do things differently because of whatever reason um, but just being open and honest about that and explaining the why behind it mm. makes people a lot more understanding and, and and willing to participate um so yeah just just take a bit of time with them and and um be be honest about your position get them to be honest about their position see if you can compromise if not um and explain the why looking at it from a slightly different perspective we've had a question here asking how to move on after an employee who who they did everything to help with their work life balance, but that to fire them, I think, and I think they're struggling to move on. Mm. Um, how how can how can managers manage themselves? I suppose is in those sorts of situations. Yeah, that's a complicated um, position to be in, and I know uh, how hard that that is. I've been there. Um, and that the thing I would say is that that sounds like a, a personal situation. You know, you're asking about a question about how do I move on from something? Mm -hmm. And I really wish I could say, here's my top five things on how to move on from this situation that, that has impacted you. Mm -hmm. But again, we're so individual. We just, I can't give you, I, I can't give you generic advice and promise that that's going to work. So if you are finding that you're impacted by something, I strongly advise you to talk to someone about it. Yeah. And, and, and get an opportunity to share your, your position and what happened 
and have someone be able to support you on an individual level mm. so you know you might get that from your HR department um a class are great at, if you want to talk about employment law situations um and you know go and talk to a therapist a counsellor get an opportunity to, to voice things get things off your chest and process it it's difficult to process everything sometimes so I'm a big advocate for get your own support remember you can't pour from an empty cup yeah I think I said that that's a really important phrase for us to take from today this is a, an interesting one um if flex working is not a contractual change do you really need to have to negotiate with an employee to get them back into the office oh. mm. <laughs> <laughs> right I think that okay do you really need to it depends on what uh direction you look at it you know contractually if they've got a contract that says you expect to be here etc um then you know legally you've got you've got a place to stand um but and there's a big but um i have seen many organizations lose a lot of talent and struggle to attract talent because they're going down this route of everyone back in the office you know and and that's why um mm. it's because I said so you know that kind of approach and you, you've got to understand that we are now moving into a different world of work and actually people are looking at jobs that afford them a better work-life balance and honestly take time to ask people what that means to them because you know, sometimes when you understand their position more, it might help you value them. You know, we're seeing more dads be able to spend time at home with their young children. We're seeing parents be able to, to let see work because of the working from home and the childcare is balanced. Um, we're seeing people with neurodiverse conditions absolutely thriving in a job that is more remote because you know, their needs weren't catered for appropriately when they were in an, in, a, in an office working environment. And with, you know, you can unlock a lot of talent if you are more adaptable to that flexible work. And I promise you, if you look into it and understand people a bit better, you may value why the work-life balance is so much more valuable for you. No, I, th I think very much. And also, I think you often get a, a much better employee as well, don't you, who feel listened and heard and, and you, you, they're engaged, aren't they? So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're looking for some top tips here for um, staff that are home based. Um, they like to any tips yeah. to how to check in with people, keep their finger on the pulse. Um, top tips for remote check ins, I suppose. That is a good question. Um, so I'll be I'll be honest. I've got people that that work for me that I've never met face to face, um, and I like to think that we've got a really good working relationship. Um, and some of the things that I made sure to do was to have enough conversations that weren't just were just about work. <laughs> you know, just say how are you? What did you get up to at the weekend? Um, you know, I had someone take a holiday and I'm like, I very much hope that you have an amazing time. And if I see an email from you, I'll be sending you a frowny face back. And I just, you know, made it a bit playful, but just kind of say, like, please don't talk to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't contact me for your own good. Um, and, um, yeah, taking some time to know who they are and, and what their life is like outside of the work that we do together um and so yeah again take time I think is one of the things that I've said quite a lot in these questions um and I prefer virtual Facebook these virtual video call meetings rather than just phone calls or messaging um I think you come across differently you can you can you know demonstrate that more active listening and empathy when you have these virtual calls um we have regular check-ins together Sometimes we don't need them, so we just cancel them. Um, and uh, other times we get together and I'm like, we just have a cup of tea, see where we're at, tell me anything that you're concerned about. Um, 
And then the other thing, if I was in a wider organization, um, there's some brilliant tools that you can you can adapt, like anonymous surveys and um some you can get things that plug into your uh, your Slack channels and things that kind of ask you occasional questions about how you're getting on and and it's anonymous and then you know that might mean that you get answers that you don't necessarily get face to face but that's a good thing so you know you can do something about it um so yeah regular check-ins having surveys um things like that I would say are, are my top top tips can, can, can I can I add a little note for being an older older person um my technical skills are not are not that great and um i find keeping up with how to best use technology i mean we had a conversation didn't we um prior to yeah. school about emojis and, yeah, and and communication and i think it's really important mm -hmm. to make sure that we keep everybody able to yeah. use the remote technology don't we because some of us take a little bit more to get to get to the groove than other people and um for us to be able to communicate as effectively, I think is you know, make make sure everybody's got access to to the remote communication tools, isn't it? Absolutely, uh, you want to keep everyone comfortable. So you're 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 so right. If um if we were going to have a chat, I might say, you know, do you prefer to check in when we're at the office next? And um, you know, we'll just take the first half hour of the day to get, grab a coffee and check in, and just you know that might be something that makes you feel more comfortable whereas someone else actually might feel more comfortable at home because they're in a private environment they can speak more freely or or the other way maybe they can't speak freely at home and again it's better in the office so yeah just kind of adapting yourself to different people you know it really is opening the door to knowing people as individuals isn't it rather than saying as a manager i'm always going to do this for everybody and i'm always going to do that for everybody it really is opening the door to to, to knowing people better isn't it so um yeah easily. we haven't got to all the questions but i think we have run out of time i'm afraid so ellis thank you so much i think there's just real valuable stuff there there's been some 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 great comments made and that sort of thing so thank you so much for today um i'll just reiterate that um we are going to be sending out a recording to everybody and there's going to be some resources coming out as well so i hope you yeah. find them useful and we shall look forward to seeing everybody soon. So thank you once again, Alice. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.